Hey, good morning. Hey, before I get into the message this morning, I want to share some news, some information with you about our church that I think is going to be an encouragement to and, and maybe help you to be more at ease when you come onto this campus. Listen, you and I both know, right? It's no secret. There's a lot of violence going on in our country. And this violence, this senseless violence results in, in these needless deaths of innocent people. It's just heartbreaking. It's like, why, why, why? You probably asked that a million times. Why, why, why? It's hard for us to make sense of this. <clears throat> but it's also hard for me to understand why this violence even reaches into churches in America. It's happening. Churches in America are not uh, free from having violence on their campus. I mean, this would have been unheard of when I was growing up. You, the church was a sacred place. It was a place that you went to to be safe. In fact, sometimes criminals even went there to get away from the cops. You remember those days? No more. No more. But I want you to know that more than a several years ago, this church took some action as we began to see the landscape of America and what was happening to provide an additional level of security on this campus. It's happening right now, whether you see it or not. Because you see, we have a team of people who are our eyes, they're our ears, they're looking around, and their express purpose when they, we gather on Sunday is to provide a deeper level of security when we gather as a church. So I hope that sets you at ease a little bit. I mean, we call these people gatekeepers. They're guarding the gate. And they're made up of law enforcement, firefighters, medical personnel, people who are already trained on how to handle these kind of situations. I went out and talked to a couple of them after first service, and they're there. They're working. They're watching out for us. We have a team of four to five that are here every Sunday, and they just serve quietly behind the scenes. You may see them. You may not see them. I don't care if you don't see them just as long as they're here, right? They're right. Now, it's a sad statement, isn't it, that we have to go to this length, this measure in our country, but it's necessary. In fact, I think it's essential for such a time as we live in in our culture today. So my hope, my hope is that in sharing this, that when you come onto this campus, you'll know that that's happening and you can kind of come with a little more ease and a little more peace of heart knowing you have people watching out for us. Okay? Yeah. Sounds good. Time to share that. Yeah, it's time to share that. Let me pray for us before we get in the message. Father, I am so grateful for these men and women who each week come with an express purpose to love us, to care for us, to protect us. They know what to do, and their eyes, and they're watching, and they're, they're looking out for us, God. And we would just pray for your protection on this LBF Church campus. We, we pray that they have nothing to do but to watch. We pray that there's not anything going to go on, but, but God, we thank you for how you lead us and guide us to put things in place that will just help us be more at ease and, and to be wise in how we use our time and how we prepare for the future. So, Father, as we get into the message today, I just want to ask that you'd help us to make this, this mental heart transition from what I've just talked about to what we're going to talk about. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as I said, we're going to shift gears a little bit, but just a little bit, because some of what we're going to talk about today is not so much violence like what we're seeing, but it has to do with how we as Christians live in a culture the right way when the culture is not really friendly to Christianity. I don't know if it's news to you, but the things that I read and the things that I see tell me that the religious viewpoints of Americans today have significantly changed over the past several decades. I mean, 50 years ago, I was alive 50 years ago. How many of you were 50? You can admit it. This, it's embrace this age thing, right? Okay, so if you were alive 50 years ago, you know that we were a nation in which the majority of the population would say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Now, there may have been a little change in what they believed at that time, but they thought they were Christians, and so there was this friendliness to this. Only a small number of Americans would describe themselves as non-religious or atheists or, or even part of another world religion. But today, that spiritual landscape has changed in ways I didn't even think it would ever change here in America. We're currently living in a postmodern, post-Christian culture. 
And in this culture, in some places around our country, there just seems to be people who just want to ignore us. Oh, these guys, we don't want to deal with them anymore. They're not relevant. You know, they're out of date. They're believing some strange things. We don't want to have anything to do with them. But in some cases, there can be some what we might call persecution or hostility to Christians, especially when our Christian beliefs rub up against their way of non-Christian living. When we rub up against them in some way, there can be some reaction. Now, let me just stop here for a second, because if you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, this is not a message against you. This is not a message at all against you. In fact, I'm glad you're here, because I want you to hear what I'm going to say. This is not an adversarial, it's not supposed to be, an adversarial relationship between Christians and non-Christians. This is not the way it's supposed to be. What you're going to hear is how we, as who call ourselves followers of Jesus, are to respond to the people who are not Christians, who are living in our culture. How do we do this in the right way? So I hope you'll hear that from us this morning, from me this morning. And it would be my hope that as you hear this, that maybe you walked in the door with some kind of stereotypical image. Well, these Christians, you know, I know what they're against. I don't know what they're for kind of thing. I hope you would, you would hear this today, that you would hear how we want to live, how we desire to live, how we're challenged to live. So for that reason, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, yeah. Now, let me get into the message. Now, as Pastor Dan mentioned o- over this past series, this followers of Jesus are called to live differently wherever we are. Wherever you are, you're called to live a certain way. And these different types of living, at times, as I said, to our culture, as, as they look at us, they say, well, oh, they're out of touch, they're archaic, why do they live this way? But even with the current climate of that culture with us in our country, I believe this century, the 21st century, presents not only the greatest challenge, I think it presents the greatest opportunity for us as Christians. I do. Especially for those who are really living this passionate pursuit of life in Jesus. I mean, there's this wonderful opportunity, I think, for us as Christians when we live what we believe to make a huge difference in people's lives. I mean, God has given us the privilege He's given us the responsibility to live and to share the message of the gospel with whatever culture we're in currently. Even a culture that might be hostile to hearing what Christianity is all about. But this gospel message, folks, can only make a difference when we actually live what we say we believe. That's why I think this series, wherever you are, is so powerful and so wonderful. Every week I got the blanks, you know, and I'm filling in. Did I get the right word? No, Dan, he, he's, he did a different word than I thought he was going to put in. Non-retaliation, that's the word he was going to put in last week. Whoa. See, so here's our main thought for today. I'm getting ahead of myself. To be effective. Pull out your insert, speaking of blanks. And uh, I got a blank in very first thing because I want you to engage with me a little bit as you write these things down. So to be effective at living a godly life in what I'll call an ungodly culture, we Christians need to respond in the right way. So here's the question, right? I mean, how do Christians, how do followers of Jesus who want to live in a daily passionate pursuit of life in Jesus respond to the culture we live in in the right way? That's our question for today. And we're going to learn from Peter, chapter 3, verse 13 for, through 17, how to do that. So whatever form of Bible you have, whether it's printed like this or it's electronic, would you find 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 13? And while you're looking, just by way of reminder, I just want to share that in these past several weeks, just by way of review, we've been instructed as Christians how to live, wherever we are, in our relationship with the government in our relationship with those who are in authority over us. You know, there's authority over each of us somewhere. In our relationships to our employers, in our relationships between husbands and wives, in our marriage relationships. And if you remember last week, as Pastor Dan started this, pa- this, this next section, he said, Peter says, and finally, all of you. So that was part one. Today's part two of finally, all of you. <laughs> Because I really believe today is part two of a message that Dan started last week. So as we get into this, what, what did Dan talk about last week? Not to repay evil for evil. Actually, that's Peter's words, not Dan's. But not to repay evil for evil. But what? But to repay evil with blessing. With blessing. 
Talk about a radical thought, right? Talk about a radical way to live. That's right off the bat. And so as we continue that thought of of following the call of Jesus to a life of non-retaliation, if you miss that message, you gotta go back and listen to that. That can be a really powerful, life-changing message if we will open our hearts and minds to it. Now, Peter wrote to believers who were experiencing a very hostile world. In fact, they were experiencing some very serious persecution, much more intense than what probably you and I and our current American culture have ever experienced. But like us, there were times that we get rejected by our culture. They were being rejected. So Peter writes to give them, and I think to give us, an insight, a a new perspective, a reminder of a perspective on the right way to respond. Ready to dig in? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love it when I know you're listening with me. Verse 13, we're just gonna go one verse at a time. Here we go. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? So I'm just gonna say right off the bat, the first way to respond has to do very easily with what that verse is saying. We are to respond by being passionate about doing good. We are to be passionate. We are to be involved in doing good. Now, I've suggested this word passionate for doing good because that word eager, it says you're you're to be eager to do good. Same word. Same word. If you went back and looked at it, same word. It's, It's synonymous. It's together. You see, when someone is passionate about something, when you are passionate about something, we accept no excuses. We dig in. We do it. Even a great cost to us at times. We're totally devoted to it when we're passionate about it. The priorities of our life can even change when we're passionate about it. That's why we chose this word passionate to be part of our mission statement. You know, you keep hearing it all the time, right? You guys can probably say that now. But it's it's part of our mission statement because we want a church that is living the life of Jesus that he offers us, not in a casual way, not in a add him to my already full and pre-planned kind of life kind of way, Not in a way where I think I know how to live, I'll consult them when I don't know how to live kind of way, but to be fully devoted, Jesus-directed kind of life. And here Peter says we got to live that kind of life by being good, living goodness. And we live that way, he says, hey, it's difficult to be persecuted. It's difficult to experience harm when I have that kind of commitment to Jesus. Now the word good here, it deals with not just I did one good deed for the day. I'm done, Jesus, thanks. Make sure I have no harm in my life. That's not how it goes. No, it, it, is, it is a lifestyle. It's responding in every area of our life with goodness, not occasionally. It's a lifestyle that says, I'm gonna do the morally good thing even if the person I'm doing the good for is hostile to me, is antagonistic to me. That's just like Peter, right? I mean, these challenges not to repay evil for evil. He's challenging us to live in a non-retaliation way. I mean, have you ever been around people who just seem to get happiness out of doing good things? I mean, all of us have heard that story, right? There's a story of some guy, he finds a wallet, he opens a wallet, it's stuffed full of money. In fact, there's so much money, it's falling out, right? He's got this wallet stuffed with money, and and he's returning it to the owner. No, I don't want to get a reward. Don't want to get a reward. So they go, the guy opens his wallet, all the money is there. It's like, whoa. That, that guy is experiencing goodness as he gives to other people. And Peter is saying that kind of life, that kind of life is very difficult, very unusual for most people to mistreat someone, even if that someone is passionately following Jesus Christ. See, the world doesn't have a problem attacking people who do harm to other people, but he says they are slow to hurt people who are gracious and unselfish and kind and and merciful and thoughtful. And as we live in this culture, here's my reminder. Let's guard ourselves against getting bitter against our culture. Uh, Let's guard ourselves against getting defensive. Let's guard ourselves against becoming self-protective. Let's guard ourselves against the anger that builds up when we see things intruding on our life in some uncomfortable way. Peter would say, just keep doing good. Good, make your life about doing good. Don't don't let being harassed, don't let hostility, don't let an anti-Christian attitude, don't let that terrible violence that's happening around the world move us towards retaliating in some way. Like we learned last week, don't return evil for evil. Be in love with goodness. You see, when it becomes your delight 
When you're in love with being good, when, when it becomes your joy, when it becomes your goal, when the wrong things lose their fascination to you, when the wrong things lose their power to attract you, then you have become passionate about doing good. Our lives are to be lived in a manner that is opposite of scandal. We need to be known as people who do good. Whoa, Peter, that's the first thing that could occupy my life for a long time, just trying to live that way, right? Here's the second thing he has, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. So the thought here is that the idea of this goodness living, let's say we live that way, is not a guaranteed promise that if you do good, you will not be harassed or you will not be persecuted or you will not be made fun of in some way. So the second way to respond, the right way to respond, is to be willing to accept the possibility of suffering. (laughs) Not only do we have to have this passion for goodness, we have to be willing to accept the possibility that living that life There may be suffering, so there will be times. I love how this verse begins. He says, but even if. Another way to say that is, hey, don't be surprised. And don't be surprised when you get suffering in some way or you get persecuted in some way, you're made fun of. I mean, lots of people have done nothing but good in their lives and they have not experienced goodness. They have been persecuted. And the people Peter wrote to were in fact suffering. It was happening to them. To them, they were suffering because of the doing good in the name of Jesus. They were trying to follow the faith of Jesus and they demonstrated it as respectable and godly behavior and yet they got, they were involved in suffering. And listen, we're not done with this subject. You're going, oh, I hope Gary gets done because I don't want to talk about suffering anymore. Hey, chapter four, Peter, you know what he says? He's not through with us when he says, be ready, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal. What do you think that is? He's reminding us because it's so hard for us as Christians. We think, no, there shouldn't be suffering involved. But this idea and this theme that that we will suffer for following Jesus talked about all through this letter. And each time he says, hey, don't be surprised. Yeah, it's going to be harder to hurt someone, mistreat someone who does good. But it can happen, and it might happen to you, so don't be surprised. Don't see it as something strange. Don't see it as a foreign thing. Well, I'm following Jesus. I shouldn't suffer. It can happen. So when you're ridiculed or mocked for your faith, or or when you're ignored or passed over for that promotion because of your faith, not because of your bad work habits, or when you feel isolated or cut off from everyone because of your faith, Peter would say, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. In fact, not only is it not to be a surprise, it's to be seen as a privilege. What? What? A privilege? Why? Because it's a privilege, we learn throughout Scripture, to share in the sufferings of Jesus. Now, you're sitting here as a believer, maybe you're a new one, maybe you've been a believer a long time, and you're going, really? (laughs) Really, Gary? Is that what I signed up for? I thought I was just signing up for eternal life and get free from hell. (laughs) I signed up for suffering? Yeah, it is. We go back to chapter 2, verse 21. Look at this. It says it's on the screen. You have been called for this purpose. What purpose? If you look at just a verse or two before, doing good while you're bearing up under unjust suffering is what he says. You've been called for this. Why? Since Christ also left also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. And the example is found in verse 23, which says, he entrusted himself to him. Him who? God, who judges rightly. We talked a lot about that last week. Now that's the example. Jesus not only died in our place, bearing the punishment of God for our sins, but he showed us how to suffer injustice. He gave us an example. Here it is. Don't get angry. Don't get hostile. Commit yourself to God. Utter no threats. And you're blessed. What? You're blessed when you suffer? I mean, what is that about? It does not compute. How can suffering be a blessing? What's Peter trying to say? Well, it's not so much about, oh, I'm happy I'm suffering. No, but as I said a moment ago, it's about being highly privileged. You are blessed because you are privileged to suffer for the sake of Jesus who suffered for you. You're also going to receive a reward. How do I know that? I'm going to jump to Matthew chapter 5, the very words of Jesus. Just want to real quickly move there. It's on the screen. Jesus said this, blessed are you when people, when you 
Blessed are you, pardon me, I can't read. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely, not truthfully, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. A little later on he says, be glad. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. Don't we like rewards? Don't we? All these college football guys are trying to make it to the last game and get that trophy. And you go to the school and they got this whole wall full of trophies, if you're Alabama anyway. You know, because because we like rewards, don't we? We like rewards. So you and I are to consider it a privilege to take the blows meant for Jesus because we take a stand for him. We're promised an eternal reward. But let's not forget the very end of verse 14. He says in quotes, do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. Huh? Don't fear? It's scary. Don't be anxious, really? I gotta pray about that one. And don't be disturbed. In other words, he says, stay calm. Stay calm. This is a quote from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 12. And in the context, this is part of an exhortation that Isaiah was giving for the people of Israel to remember that God is the Lord God Almighty. Don't worry about people. God is the Lord God Almighty. All injustices will be taken care of. You don't need to worry about it right now. And he is the one to be followed, (coughs) not people. So how do we respond in the right way? We live with a passion for doing good. We accept the possibility of suffering. Here's the third way. Look at verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. So here's the blank. We live with Jesus as our Lord. That's pretty easy. Took me a whole long time to figure out that word, that statement right there. Not really, I'm just kidding. What does it mean to live with Jesus as your Lord? What does that mean? Listen, I came to faith when I was very young. I was seven years old. And I believe at that time I was saved. I understood my sinfulness. But I had no understanding of what it meant to be, have Jesus as my Lord. And, 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 and I was this kid and I was trying to grow up and un- <coughs> understand this spiritual life. And my parents took me to church every week. And I heard these stories and it was all good. But it didn't, it didn't really commute the, compute that Jesus is going to be my Lord. And I just remember that when I wasn't a minor anymore and I was growing up and I was in my college years, I was like, yeah, Jesus is supposed to be my Lord. And that Lordship means he's supposed to control. I'm supposed to give him every area of my life. What does that mean? I'm supposed to give him every area of my life. You see, to live with Jesus as the Lord means we allow him to be the master of our life, the controller. We can say we are his slaves. We do what he says. He is the owner of our life. We consult him about our life. I remember after Miriam and I got through with the first five years of marriage and fighting with each other, and we actually got into a better place where we could talk and have, have, have good conversation, that, that, that we started asking ourselves this question, how should we live with Jesus as the Lord of our life, as, as a married couple? It was an important decision. It was important. We got to allow him to be Lord of our life. To allow someone to be the Lord of your life means that you submit to all that he is and it teaches and directs. In this case, for Christians, it's about following Jesus, right? So, for example, when Jesus says, ready for this one? I think suffering is tough. He says, love your enemies. Those are the words of Jesus. He says, love your enemies. You respond how? In trust. And you do your best to say, how do I do that, God? How do I love my enemies? When he says, don't worry about tomorrow, remember that passage, but tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. We respond how? In trust. And we give our worries and our cares and anxiety. God in prayer. And he changes our hearts. When he says, <laughs> deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. What do we do? <laughs> That's too hard, God. I'm not doing that one. That's not the lordship of Christ in every area of my life. We say, okay, I'm going to focus my attention on others first. I'm going to deny myself, and I'm going to take up your cross, and I'm going to follow you like you have taught me how to do. See, to let Jesus be the Lord of your life means we submit to his purposes for living our life. Okay, so we learned a couple of ways. Three ways to respond. When I was taking uh, preaching in school, they said you should have a three-point sermon, but I have five points, and I hope... I hope they're okay with that because I have two more points. You got time for two more points? Okay, good. Thank you. Here we go. Here's the fourth point. Here it is. We are ready to tell why we live the way we do. We are ready to tell why we live the way we do. Look at the last half of verse 15. It says this. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. 
but do this with gentleness and respect. When people say to you, for example, why do you insist on the, this message of Jesus? Why is it always about Jesus? Or why won't you go along with this culture? Or why won't you accept what this culture is accepting? I mean, get with the times, man. You're way behind the times. And why do you say abortion is wrong? Doesn't everybody have rights? <coughs> why, don't you, why don't you take revenge on that person who just wronged you? Why do you say people having sex outside of marriage is wrong? Why, why, why? Why not just roll into the culture and make life easy for yourself instead of having all this stuff go on? I mean, what are you gaining from this after all? It doesn't feel like you're gaining anything. I mean, why is this so important? You know what Peter would say? Be ready. Be ready. Be ready with an answer for why you believe what you believe and why you live the way you live. Be ready to talk about why you can have hope when this world is so filled with violence. Be ready to talk about how you can have a hope when... Who knows when this is going to happen again, but the economy goes in the dumpster. Be ready to talk about how you can have hope when your health is failing. Be ready to talk about how you can have hope when it looks like nothing is going right in your life. Be ready to talk about why you say no when other people say yes. Go ahead. He says, give an answer. Give an answer. Now, this word answer here is the word defense. Defense or apologetic. But don't get me wrong, we're not apologizing for our faith. That's not what this word apologetic means. No, it, it's, it's like giving a defense for why you believe what you believe, much like if you were to give a defense in a court of law. Do you know there are people probably in countries around our world that have actually had to do this, they had to stand before a court in, in, in some kind of foreign country and, and tell them why they're not gonna uh, renounce Jesus Christ, they're gonna hang on to him and pay the consequences for that? Now, this doesn't mean that all of us as Christians have to be highly skilled as, as an apologist. I mean, they got college professors who are that. But, but we don't have to be as skilled. We're not like an attorney for the faith. That's not what we're about. But it does mean that each of us as believers in Jesus, we need to grasp and be able to articulate some of the essentials of our faith and have the ability to explain to others why we are a Christian. Why are we doing this? And that answer really should come from our own, much of it should come from our own personal story of, of our own life with Jesus, about our life before and our life after and all the stuff we work through. We're re- we need to be ready to give a solid answer for why we believe and why, what the hope that we have is. What is the hope? What is the hope that we live with? Now, there's, I got two parts for this. The hope, first part of the hope is we're living in a way when we pursue life in Jesus that is filled with everything that can be meaningful to us and purposeful for us, we, live, we fill our lives with meaning and purpose. I mean, Jesus is God. We're following him, and he gives us the best opportunity to have life here on this planet. And then we know what? There is life after death. If you're a non-Christian here, you go, well, I'm not sure I believe that one. Give it some time. There's some life after death and that God has prepared for us in a place called heaven. And in that place, we know there's no more suffering. There's no more pain. There's no more darkness. No more death. (laughs) And in that new environment of heaven, there is going to be everlasting joy, everlasting happiness. No more darkness. Can you believe that? Light. How are we going to sleep for heaven's sake? I have no idea. (laughs) See, Why we do what we do and why we live the way we live, it's because of that hope. It's because of the hope that Jesus gives us both now and forever. Now, it's been a while since we studied 1 Peter, but I want to go back to chapter 1 of 1 Peter. And the words are going to be on the screen, the verses I'm going to read. I want to read several verses that kind of has, here's Peter's description of our hope. You ready? Follow along with me. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, exclamation point. Okay? And in his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope, not a dead hope, a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus conquered death and into an inheritance that can never what? Perish, spoil, fade. Those are great words. Never. This inheritance, he says, is kept. It's not going to get lost. It's kept in heaven for us. In all of this, what do we do? We greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Whoa, there's suffering again back in chapter one. Peter is trying to give us a perspective and he's trying to get us ready. 
to give an answer. Are you ready? Are you ready? You're probably sitting there, oh, no, Gary, I'm not even close to being ready. Can I challenge you? Get ready. I don't know how you use your time throughout the week, but is there time for you to take some intentionality to get ready? Is there time for you when we start these Tuesday night classes again to talk about doctrine and other things that Dan teaches for you to get ready, get prepared? Get ready. Now, one more thing about this. How we give this answer is so important. Peter says how? Do it with gentleness and respect. There's this attitude we're to have of love, care for the person who's asking us. It's not to be condescending. It's not to be hostile. It's not to be in your face. It's not to be, I am a better person than you because I'm going to heaven and you may not be. That's not our attitude. It's to be patient and loving and kind and a caring answer, recognizing that this person that God has put into your life asking you this question or that you need to talk to was made what? In the image of God (coughs) and has irreplaceable value as a human being who needs what you have. So how do we respond in the right way in this culture? We have a passion for goodness. We accept a willingness to suffer. We keep our life responding to the Lordship of Jesus and we're ready with an answer. Okay, sounds like enough, right? No, we got one more. Here's the sixth one, or the fifth one. Comes from the last part, uh, actually it comes from verse 16. But the last part of 15 and 16 are like one sentence. I don't know if you know this, but the numbers that are put in there, the verse numbers, they were not inspired by the original writers. So people have tried to put those in to help get, make sense for us. So here you got this sentence. He says, but do this with gentleness and respect. And he goes on and he says, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So there's the fifth way. You know what it is, right? Got to keep a clear conscience. Our conscience is this moral and spiritual compass that God placed inside of every human being to direct us in the decision and choice-making processes of life. Everyone has a conscience. And as for Christians, it's through our conscience that the Holy Spirit leads, guides, directs. The more we yield and respond to those nudges that he gives us, the more doing the right thing will become normal and a natural way of life for us. So say yes to God. Remember, I've said that many times. I just want to wake up and say yes to you today, God, not no. Yes. You know, people are going to try and make you feel bad. They're they're going to try and make you feel guilty for believing what you do, or they're going to cause you to get angry. But if your conscience is clear, they can't succeed, says Peter. So we need to live with a clear conscience. Why? So that the conscience we have does not condemn us. And when it doesn't condemn us, we can take whatever comes and be calm. We can be at ease. We can be at peace. And then when your enemies see that in you, he says, when they come to slander you and you have a clear conscience... They are the ones that end up feeling ashamed. That's not your goal, by the way, but it's just a result. So if there's sin in your life, you're, gonna have, you're not going to have a clear conscience, right? <coughs> you're not going to be at ease before God when trouble comes. I ran across uh, Psalm 32 this week. It's on the screen behind me. David wrote this. He says, when I kept silent. When I kept silent about what? He kept silent about his sin. When I kept silent about my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. When I read that, I go, I don't want that to be me. I mean, it's like his life is dried up and resulted in physical repercussions as well as fears and anxieties. Why? Because he had guilt, unresolved guilt. But if your conscience is pure, if it is clear and finds nothing to condemn you, then Peter says you can respond with faith and trust and peace. And my encouragement to you is to confess your sins as soon as you've sinned. You know, don't do this. Live throughout your whole day. You're brushing your teeth. You're all ready for bed. You jump into bed and say, oh, before I go to sleep, God, one more thing. I just want to confess all my sins. I know I did some today. I'm not sure what they were, but I just want to make sure that I'm good with you, so please forgive me. That's not the way to confess your sins. No. Instead, confess specifically, immediately, and receive the forgiveness that God offers. Because you want nothing to hinder that relationship you have with God. He desires to have a close relationship with you. It's kind of like, you know, if I do wrong against my wife and I just ignore it like nothing happened, or I say, oh, forgive me, you know, I don't know what it was, but please, I'm sure I did something wrong. We are not going to be very close, are we? But if I can come to her and I can say, dear, please forgive me for this, this, and this, 
My heart's been hurting over this. I hope you'll continue to love me. She will forgive me. And then what does that do? It brings a closeness in the relationship. That's the way it is with God. And I believe that as we remain faithful to live out our faith and profess this belief, and we're going to be persecuted in the same way. We need to have a clean conscience before God. And I can't tell you precisely what's going to come or how it's going to come, but I see a nation moving far away from God, not closer to God. How about you? God is not somebody people are intentionally seeking after for the most part. And many things are driving us away from God. So Peter ends this passage by a reminder with us. Verse 17. It's not on the screen. I forgot it. I forgot the verse. Please forgive me. I feel good now. So, for it is better, Peter says, for it is better. You just have to listen with me. If it is God's will, it is better if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. See, Christians can thrive today. They can thrive when they take these right responses and when they live them out and in the process, we will probably learn how to suffer better than we are today. Remember, Peter says all the way back, when we did that temporary residence series, all the way back he says, hey, you're a foreigner in this world. You're a stranger in this current world. So don't be surprised if you're treated like one. See, our task, though, is not just to survive, not just to protect ourselves, not to go find some safe place and run away to it, not, not just to live as comfortably as we can now, just kind of getting it through till we die and go to heaven. No, our task is to make a difference, a life-changing difference to help people see Jesus. What Jesus? The real, authentic Jesus through us. I've often asked God, is that really a good plan? He goes, yeah. He wants people to see Jesus as we live a life that's pursuing him so we can be at ease as we live these things. Because if we live our lives responding that way, we can have confidence that whatever comes, whether it comes or even whether it doesn't come, we can make a difference for people who don't know Jesus. That's my heart. I hope that's your heart too. Let's pray together. Father, you have done so much in my heart over the preparation of this message. You have reminded me and taught me as I've studied and prepared for this time. And I want to thank you for the time you've given me to be able to just share these words with this LBF Church family. And I ask you, God, to help them to take the truth that Peter has written to us and infuse it into their lives on a daily basis. Maybe if they take one at a time, I don't know, God, but help us to not just hear it and be done with it and go on in our life like it never happened, but would you change us? And would you use us in a spiritually powerful and meaningful way as we, as we walk with people who don't know you, who are looking closely at us to know what kind of life do these people live and why? Use us to help people find eternal hope, the hope that we live with. And And God, even as we now transition our time and our thoughts into communion, we would just ask that as we remember this time, Lord Jesus, where you gave your life, you gave your body, you gave your blood for us. It was not without pain. It was not without suffering. So would you open our hearts and minds to the depth of your love for us, and would you help us transfer that to a depth of love for others? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.